Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome President and CEO, the Kresge Foundation, Rip Rapson. Good afternoon, President Clinton. It's just a huge pleasure to be here. I want to talk today about Detroit. It's a word that summons vivid images on a number of fronts. Automobiles, Motown music, but also, regrettably, blight, political dysfunction, economic duress. I want to paint a very different picture for you, however. A city in the midst of profound positive change. A city working at the sharp edge of innovation because its very survival depends on it. You know, I had a foundation that has deep roots in Detroit, so I want to describe three examples of how Kresge and its partners are working differently in the city to bring about a very different municipal trajectory. I'll talk about um, transit, I want to talk about entrepreneurship, and I want to talk about land use. So first, transit. There probably are not very many communities in the United States more hostile to public transit than Detroit, <laughs> right? But philanthropy and the private sector are working hard to change that. Shortly after I came to Detroit, I had the opportunity to have lunch with Roger Penske, who's one of the great corporate leaders of the city, to talk about what his next civic contribution would be. I suggested to Roger that Detroit desperately needed a light rail line that would run up and down the Woodward Corridor, the region's spinal cord. Roger was uh, intrigued and took the suggestion seriously, convening about 20 civic leaders to talk about the feasibility of the idea. The problem was the price tag. It was going to cost $100 million. So Roger turned to me and said, Rip, if Kresge will put in the first $35 million, uh, I'll do my best to raise the rest. Well, when you think about it, it's kind of a crazy idea. Municipalities build light rail systems. Foundations don't build light rail systems. But the audacity of the aspiration seemed to justify the risk, or at least seemed to me to justify the risk. So we agreed. We subsequently put together a private philanthropic partnership that over the next number of years navigated almost inconceivable cascades of impediments, from bureaucratic intransigence to engineering complexity to delays and cost increases, you name it. But we raised. $175 million, cleared out the political underbrush, and did what no city in America has, which is to create a light rail system that was planned by and predominantly financed by the philanthropic and private sectors. We're going to break ground next month. And it's... <laughs> Thank you. You know, it's going to change lives in Detroit. A nurse recently told me that her colleagues, for the first time, are going to be able to live downtown, not have to own a car, and then be able to hop the train to their job at the Detroit Medical Center. So that's the first new way of working transit. The second is creating an ecology of entrepreneurialism. Detroit has been a monoculture centered around the automobile industry for the better part of a century. The Kellogg, Kresge, and Ford Foundations a number of years ago put together a fund that would, great, that would ultimately grow to about $135 million to help diversify the city's economy by supporting small businesses. At that point, it was the largest philanthropic fund ever assembled for an American city. The resulting vibrancy in Detroit has been breathtaking. There have been hundreds and hundreds of new restaurants, tech firms, small business service organizations, arts and cultural activities, all reweaving the fabric of the city. Now, Chef Clinton Moore is a great example of this. A couple of years ago, Chef Moore opened a small farm-to-table restaurant in Indian Village, a neighborhood that hasn't seen a sit-down village, a sit-down sit village, that's an interesting idea, um, <laughs> a sit-down restaurant in 15 years. Chef Moore said to me, I'm bullish about Detroit. It's a wide open market where anything and everything can prosper. So the second new way of working is entrepreneurship. The third is land use. Detroit's 80,000 blighted and abandoned homes. You just saw uh, Baltimore's 15,000 Detroit. 80,000 blighted and abandoned homes consume a land mass the size of the city of San Francisco. Kresge, over a very painful four-year period, gave birth to something called the Detroit Future City Plan, 
which is a blueprint for how the city might reimagine its use of land, both by reinforcing nodes of strength, but also by converting those blighted properties into more productive uses. Just last month, a blight remediation task force uh, formulated a blueprint within that larger blueprint. The task force dispatched 125 young people equipped with iPhones to survey the conditions of every parcel in the city of Detroit, all 390,000 of them. The resulting inventory will provide a platform that will drive decisions about which properties have to be demolished, which can be rehabilitated, and which can be deconstructed and recycled. As a woman named Ann Burns said to me, I see in this effort a real sincere desire to help people who have been waiting a long time. You know, the residents of the city of Detroit have been waiting a really long time, an unconscionably long time, to see their life opportunities improve. The three new ways of working that I've suggested, transit, economic diversification, safe and stable neighborhoods, hold the promise that that long wait may actually be coming to an end. So stay tuned. A new Detroit is coming into focus. Thank you very much.